Today's presentation is about axis deer. And I know this is a topic that is interesting to a lot of people and that a lot of y'all are looking forward to. We haven't had a lot of information about it before, um, but joining us today is Matt Buholtz, who is a PhD candidate at Texas Tech University, working with Drs. Grisham and Conway. And he's going to be sharing the research that he's been doing for his dissertation um, and include in that a little bit of the effects of the February freeze, but primarily focus on the biology and ecology of this non-native species. Being from the Hill Country, I'm sure everyone knows about axe deer, but just to give a little bit of, of background on them, uh, they were introduced here in, in 1932. So we have had them for about 90 years now. Um, but beyond that, we really don't know much about those introductions. Um, we, we don't know where they were from. Um, we know axis deer are from uh, India, Nepal area, but we don't know what part of their native range they were, they were um, captured from. Uh, we don't know how many were, were brought here. Uh, we don't know the sex, sex ratio of those initial. Um, we don't really know um, any of that. It's it kind of, that information, if it exists still, is buried somewhere and functionally lost. Um, we also, beyond that they were introduced to Kerr, somewhere in Kerr County, we don't know anything else. We don't know what part of Kerr County, we don't know the ranch, we don't know the people. All we know is that it was somewhere in Kerr County. Um, now, since 1932 and those, that introduction to Kerr County, there's now a free ranging population throughout the Edwards Plateau ecoregion and beyond. Um, so you probably know the Edwards Plateau ecoregion as mostly the hill country um, and a little bit to the west. Um, so, so there's a lot of them. We don't, uh, I'll go into kind of how many we think there might be. Um, we just know it's a very large population. And regulatory wise, they exist in a very gray area. Um, Texas Animal Health Commission has authority over them only as long as they're inside of a high fence and we are dealing with some kind of disease. Um, anything other than disease-based, animal health does not deal with them. Uh, and again, it's only inside of a high fence. You take them outside of a high fence and except for the fact that you need a hunting license to hunt them, um, Parks and Wildlife has no regulatory authority over them. So you, you take them outside of a high fence, legally, they are feral animals. They exist in the same realm as uh, pigs do if they're outside, of, if, if they're free range. Um, and so because of that, without that regulatory ability over them, they've kind of ran wild and up until until we started researching them, there really wasn't that much work done on them. A little bit uh, through the 60s, a little bit through, during the 80s, but other than that, very limited amount of uh, research has been done on them in Texas. So, so first, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about how, how long do they live? Because this is this is going to build into a lot of things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so. So their previous lifespan estimates, uh, free range, been nine to 13 years in captivity. And this is, this is primarily talking zoo and breeding, um, not just huntable high, you know, the huntable high fence areas, um, 18 to 22 years as potential. We did do um, a technique called cementum annuli, which is you look at how many rings are present in the tooth root of the tooth, it's like um, tree rings where you can figure out the age. And we were able to confirm uh, a 15-year-old doe along with two 13-year-olds, a 12, two 11-year-olds, and a 10-year-old for does. And then the oldest buck we confirmed was 10. Um, and coincidentally, he was actually shot by about a 14-year-old kid on South Llano State Park. So it was really fun to be there for that. Um, but he was 10 years old, no signs of physical decline, uh, 32 inch on both sides, 
very good mass. Um, no, like I said, no evidence of malnutrition, of poor body condition, of, of physical decline, decreasing antler size. He was very appropriately the trophy buck. Um, so, so when we start looking at what's, what's the maturity age in bucks, given that we know that they live so long now, um, at least 10 years old in buck, 15 years old in does, some speculation that it's probably quite a bit older than it could be 16, 17, 18 um, at max end. Um, what is the maturity age of bucks? When are we getting not only the, the big trophy size 30 inch main beam that uh, the hunters are looking for, when are we also getting the reproductively dominant um, deer? When are they reproductively mature and dominant? And, and that's a question we don't have a 100% great answer for. Um, based upon some of the data I collected while doing this, I would say we get that 30 inch buck around five or six years old, but it's very thin antler, not a lot of mass, um, not a true trophy. You're probably looking for when those deer are putting on mass, similar to what, what this photo is here, um, you're probably looking at nine to 10 years old, honestly. And that's probably the route, probably about when they are reproductively dominant, when they are the dominant buck in the area. Um, so it takes a long time, especially when we compare this to whitetail, when we're looking at probably five or six years for, do for dominance um, and a real good, tro and a good trophy, you know, it, it takes up to maybe double that to honestly get a, a trophy axis um, on the landscape. So it, they're, they're long lived it, so they can have quite a bit of impact. So I'll go into reproduction here in a minute. Um, and, and their population can grow and they can have a lot of effect just because of how long their lifespan is, especially when we compare it to whitetail. Um, so, so that if we, if we kind of jump into reproduction, this is one of the things that I find really fascinating about axis deer because it, of how it allows their population to grow um, and grow very quickly as we, you know, they, like I said, they've only been here for 90 years, um, but their population is everywhere. Um, so, so reproductively for, for does, their reproductive cycle is as fast as nine months. And what I mean by that is they can go from uh, having a fawn born, their first fawn to their second fawn is nine months. Um, it's, it's a two or about a seven and a half months gestation. And then they are capable of breeding as quick as one month post, um, partuition is fancy scientific word for, for birth. Um, so, so really they, their, their reproductive cycle only nine months and this breed while still lactating, that is not, that is not hugely uncommon in the animal world. We can do it, domestics can do it. Um, a lot of, fair amount of species can do it, but in the deer family, it is interesting. It isn't real common in the deer family. Um, so I have literally necropsied um, and gutted does that have been, people have shot and have seen fawns probably that were three months old with it. And it's, it's pregnant probably out to about a month and a half or so because we can figure out how, roughly how old the fetus is. Um, so so it, they can do this and they can have a very quick turnaround um, just from nine months. Uh, we do think that for the most part, the population is probably on a roughly 12 month cycle um, between, between births. Uh, similar to as we'd see with whitetail, that we see fawns born, you know, the same time of year each each year, um, but they are capable of doing it quicker. Uh, estrus la lasts only about three weeks. If they are not impregnated during that, they will cycle again um, very quickly, uh, about one 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 and a half, half two months after um, that estrus ends, and that's where we think it it starts to get towards the, the four to five month um, break after partuition. 
uh, for for um, the next birth. Um, pregnancy is possible to at least 13 years old. Like I said, we confirmed uh, those those 13 year old does. Uh, unfortunately, the 15 year old was not uh, checked for pregnancy uh, when when she was killed. Um, the guy who who shot her unfortunately did not check. But we know it's possible to at least 13 years old. They are physiologically capable of becoming pregnant as, as young as four months old. Um, again, we think it's probably more towards the 11 to 12 month um, at the most part. But you could theoretically get the rare doe out there that is impregnated um, as young as four months. Uh, then if we, if we jump into to bucks, there, there is two major rutting periods. We have the, the June and July, which is probably the majority of, um, of the rut, rut, and especially the part that we're primarily uh, using for hunting uh, during su hunting summer bucks. Uh, that's the largest portion of the population. Um, but then there is another rut in, in January and early February. Um, what, what is interesting here is there is actually some evidence of viable breeding capability by bucks year round. Um, and what I mean by that is, is regardless of antler status, whether they're hard antler, velvet, recently shed, um, they may still have viable sperm and they may still be able to, to impregnate a doe regardless of their antler status. Um, that is not something seen in whitetail. Uh, you know, the, when the rut happens, they're in hard antler, that's when they're breeding. Um, whereas like in, in, in Axis, it may be that a buck could, could breed year round um, and, and impregnate a doe and produce a viable fawn. Um, I, I kind of already got into it, but you know, that reproductive dominance, it may take a long time. I mean, these, it's a little tough to see, um, but these, these bucks, based upon looking at their antlers, I would guess they're somewhere in the in the seven to eight year old range. Um, so they're, they're older bucks that are, are trying to fight for being the, the dominant buck um, in the area. And, and kind of jumping into that, that viability of, of breeding again, um, th this could be some, this could be play, it could be um, testing of, of two young bucks, you know, seeing early stages, what's, what's happening um, cause this is in April. Um, but notice I, this, this guy on the right, he's in sparring position. He is actively trying to spar with the other one. Um, and that they're, they're both in velvet. Uh, this is not something that we see. Uh, you need, it's not something we would normally expect. Uh, so, you know, they, they theoretically could be sparring already well outside of the rut. Um, in velvet, potentially to see, you know, who can get the breeding opportunity. Um, so, so they have a lot of things, you know, both, both females and males that uh, allow for, a, you know, a high success, high amount of breeding um, that can increase their population very quickly. Um, if, if we go to fawns um, as, you know, the next step out of reproduction, uh, there is multiple fawning periods, and they go, you know, seven, seven, seven and a half months after the major ruts. Uh, so we have a, about 70% of the fawns being born in February and March, and this will come really big into when I talk about the freeze. Um, about 25% born in, in late July and August, and then 5% that it's kind of just seemingly random. It happens any time of the year. So, so if we look at these, these three pictures, this top one, that fawn is probably about a week old. This was taken uh, February 12th. So right at the start of February. This fawn, probably about a month old, uh, early, taken September 9th, start of August. Um, and then this fawn is probably a couple days, maybe two, three days old, um, taken November 11th, entirely random. Outside of that major, major fawning period, 
uh, outside of those major ruts. Uh, so, so that kind of leads us more into that viability of breeding year round um, that, you know, there is fawns that are just born at any time of the year. Um, so, so they are, there could be, be fawns out there anytime. And we kind of have to compare that with, with the pattern of 12 month breeding or nine month breeding and all of this and how, when, when are we depositing fawns onto the landscape? Um, and this will play into predation that I'll talk about later. Um, twins are, are very rare and actually there's never been a 100% confirmed event of twins outside of a zoo. Um, you may see fawns that have, uh, and does that have two fawns. What we think for the most part that is, is probably an adoption uh, where the, the second doe may have been killed um, and, and the first doe is, is picking up that other fawn. Um, but there has never actually been a confirmed event of twins happening in the wild. Uh, fawn survival is thought to be very high and somewhere in the 80 to 90 percent range, um, potentially higher. Uh, a good year for whitetail, we're talking 30 to 50 percent. So, so their fawn survival, with that being very high, fawn recruitment's, recruitment helps their population grow very quickly. Um, partial green vegetation diet at one and a half months, meaning they they're still uh, nursing, but they they have started to switch to to eating green vegetation, and and full weaning is somewhere around five to six months. So if if we summarize this all all together, like I said, we have year round breeding. Um, one of the questions that we have, um, and and potentially may try and figure out in the future is is what triggers estrus and rut. In whitetail, um, that's triggered by photo period, length of day. Because we have year-round breeding, multiple major ruts that do not occur six months apart from each other, so they don't have equal um, day lengths, um, what, what triggers these? And, and what we think is, is that estrus is probably triggered if first, they have to not be pregnant, which is relatively rare in the population. Um, and then probably they just need to have the nutritional status uh, to be able to go through a pregnancy because pregnancy is hugely nutritionally um, expensive. So as long as they have that status, they can go into estrus. And then what triggers the, the, the rut and bucks it may just be that there is a doe in estrus nearby. You know, if he set, senses a receptive doe, he then goes into rut. Any other bucks in the area could potentially go into rut. And it's as simple as, as just, you know, nutritional status triggers estrus, estrus triggers rut. Um, rap, rapid cycling uh, with, the, with the lifespan, um, the potential for nine month cycle, nine month cycles, um, a single doe, she could have as many as 15 um, or more breeding cycles during her lifetime. And when we factor in um, fawn survival into this, we can think of a single doe, 15 breeding cycles with fawn survival, she's probably raising up to 12 to 14 um, fawns to adulthood. And now Statistically, half of those fawns are going to be females. They have the same breeding capability as long as they're living long enough. Um, so you can see how the, the math works out here that their population can grow very quickly um, in, in terms of you know the 90 years that they've been here. We can have so many generations that have, have had such high breeding success um, fawn survival, that their population can increase very quickly. Um, timing of that primary fawning season. So remember that primary season um, when about 70% are born is February and March. 
if when we think about about weaning when they're starting to switch to that green diet one and a half months after they're born that's about april and when is the some of the best vegetation highest quality vegetation coming out in the hill country april um and may so so when they this this spawning period it's perfect for them they're they're born um in february february and march that doe she's just been able to eat a lot of high quality gra winter grasses like winter texas winter grass some others so she's built up the nutrition to be able to um have high have high nutritional condition while she's nursing and then when that fawn starts switching to eating green dot, green vegetation, it's starting to switch just when the best stuff is coming out in spring and summer. So they're, they're under the perfect situation here to have that high fawn survival because of, of having that nutri those nutrients be available when they're needing them. So kind of the next, the next part of my research building off of all that lifespan and, and reproduction stuff is how many axis are out, are out there. Um, if, if you read online, uh, the estimates vary widely. Uh, some of the more quote unquote laughable estimates are the 6,000 uh, free range. You can drive around for 30 minutes through parts of the hill country and realize there are more than 6,000 axis deer out there. Um, considering I've seen herds of 300 plus, um, I know people who have seen 600, 700, um, in a herd. So it doesn't take long to realize there's more than 6,000. Um, the, on the high end, the estimates out there are around 125,000. Um, that may be good locally, um, at more of the core of, of the access range. And when, when I say the core I'm, I'm talking um, Kimball County, Edwards County, Kerr, uh, Bandera, Kendall, Gillespie, um, Uvalde, Uvalde, probably northern, northern part of the county. Um, that area is probably the core of the Axis Deer Range, and it's probably based off of, you know, they were first introduced into Kerr County. They've, they've spread out around there. Um, so, so the estimates really very widely, but once we start really getting into the population um, ecology and estimating numbers, we don't know what we call the um, primary population parameters, and those are reproduction, uh, mortality, immigration, emigration. We don't know, because we don't know these numbers, we actually can't really model the population. We can't say how it's, how it's growing too much um, or if it's reducing, but we know it's not you know, declining. Uh, so, so what what we did is is we collected we conducted spotlight surveys, and this is specifically just for Kimball County um, because I was basing research out of Junction, um, and and we had to at some extent you know confine um, our our study area uh, logistically. But but we were looking at at distribution across the landscape. So what's what's their their density in different habitats? Does it vary? Um, do they prefer certain habitats, stuff like that? Um, and then also looking at, at white-tail density and abundance um, in comparison to, to axis. Um, so I, I unfortunately cannot show you the, the actual numbers here because they are, are about to be submitted for publication. Uh, so we're, we're keeping them, them private until uh, we, we get it published. But, but I can show you some trends. Um, if we look at the different habitats, and, and the names of these habitats are kind of arbitrary, um, what I just want to kind of point out here is, is they are ranked in highest to lowest uh, estimated density here. And if you look at the top three, floodplain shrublands, floodplain forests, floodplain grasslands. So what that means is they're all riparian habitats. They're all along the rivers. That goes with what we knew about axis habitat selection from uh, native range. They are a riparian species. They most commonly are in those areas. 
Um, so that's where they're going to have the highest effect. And the riparian habitats are some of the most sensitive uh, to disturbance, to impacts. So because they're the highest densities there, they could have pretty high, um, great effects. If you look at the upland habitats, so these are our deciduous shrublands, um, grasslands, mesquite, live oak, juniper um, area. Not surprisingly, juniper was the lowest estimate. Um, there, I have seen axis eat juniper. It is not high on their list of, of things to eat though. Um, it's probably a more of a cover crop, but it, again, um, we'll get into some of the habitat preference where juniper grows for the most part is not the habitat that axis are, are probably selecting for. Um, but if we look at the average of the upland habitats versus the riparian habitats, riparian, the average of these three is four times higher than the average of the five upland habitats. That says to us obvious, that Axis, they are selecting riparian habitats. They probably are having great impacts on those highly sensitive, highly reproductive, er highly productive areas that provide um, a lot of resources to whitetail, other wildlife, a lot of resources for sheep and, and goat grazing, um, cattle grazing, a lot of things happens uh, in those very sensitive riparian habitats that we rely on, um, not only commercially, economic based, but culturally, and um, just the health of the river itself. Uh, so, so they can have a lot of impacts based upon what we're seeing in these, in these estimates. And I'm, I'm hoping to get these estimates out in the next few months. Um, they're, they should be submitted for publication in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, and the journal we're going to is pretty quick. So, so hopefully they will be out and publicly available uh, relatively soon. Uh, so, so habitat preference, I, I, and I just went into it quite a bit. They are riparian, riparian. They need water at least once per day. So they are going to those water sources. Um, that could be man-made um, water sources. I have seen them um, in some areas. They, they seem to maybe have a slight preference for, for man-made uh, water sources, guzzlers, um, troughs, and, and others. And, and that may just be because they're more uh, in secluded areas, more protected areas, um, allowing them to have, have some more defense. Um, and, and like it, that goes into you know how they're, they're, they seem to have a grassland shrubland um, mix as a preference. So because they're primarily grass eaters, um, although do eat a fair amount of forbs and shrubs, they're with, with, when they have a grassland shrubland mix, they not only have abundant food sources, they also have the available cover nearby um, to, to escape from hunters, predators, um, and, and other things that, you know, may, for some reason they, they seem as a threat. Uh, the bottomland forests also highly, highly preferred. Uh, they do avoid rocky terrain, and that's where it gets into those, that juniper. So when we get into the high country, um, parts, of the, parts of the hill country, we get into um, the tops of hills, mostly rock. Um, juniper is kind of is the overwhelming dominant uh, vegetation. They're, they're not in those areas um, in, in high numbers. Uh, where we do see them in, in juniper is a little bit more spread out juniper, not as rocky terrain. Um, they have, have more other food sources that are not being completely um, blocked out uh, by the juniper. So, so as you know, going off that into vegetation, they, they are what we call an, an intermediate mixed feeder. Um, so you, on, on one end of the spectrum, you have grazers who are, who are just eating grass. At the other end of the spectrum, you have browsers uh, who are eating shrubs, trees, um, forbs, which colloquially weeds um, and flowering, flowering plants. Um, so 
axis are in the middle of that. They consume everything. Uh, they consume grasses, forbs, trees, shrubs, nuts, um, acorns, fruits, anything really. Um, they, they do seem to have a somewhat of a preference for grasses uh, that, but the diet consists of, of largely what is available at that time of the year. Uh, so if, if we look at, at, this is one of my vegetation exposures um, on, on a private property that we were to the left is uh, excluded from deer are kept out to the right is open. Um, and, and a lot, you can really see the height of the grasses. I mean, the, the winter grass and a bunch of other grasses in here, about 18 to 20 inches inside of the exclosure, about uh, three to four inches at most outside. Um, and because whitetail are a browser, do not eat any large amount of grass, uh, there were no sheep and goat, goats or cattle on this particular ranch. Um, so all of that effect in grasses that you see in that photo is from axis. That is, you know, a 16 inch difference from axis grazing that is happening at, in that, um, at that exposure site. So, so they have quite the effect um, on, on grass biomass. That all being said, uh, like I said, diet consists of what is available. It is probably quality over quantity. So grasses over browse. Um, but some of their preferred species that we do know, we don't know a whole lot of, of particular at the species level, what they're probably selecting for. Um, but, but some of the ones we do know from the research in the 80s, uh, Texas winter grass, buffalo grass, grandma species, blue stem species, um, a, lot of, a lot of natives and, and some mixed um, exotic grasses in there too. So, so they, they do have some, spe uh, some species preferred that we would look for uh, as, as grazing sources for livestock and, and other potential wildlife grazers. So, you know, the impacts on vegetation, you saw it at that six, you know, the difference in, in grass, grass height, but this is even a better um, example. This is on um, South Atlanta River State Park, south of Junction. Uh, the background is the exposure. The foreground is, is outside. You have bare ground outside and grass is um, six to eight inches tall inside. Uh, so, you know, there, here's a really good example of removing those, those native grasses. And uh, in particular, this particular exposure, we actually built purposefully inside of a frostweed patch. So uh, underneath that frostweed was for the most part bare ground um, originally. And as this exposure was allowed to, to grow, what we actually started realizing is there's probably quite the native seed bank of grasses underneath that, that frost weed that has just never really had the um, opportunity to, to grow because deer come in and hit it before it ever gets high enough that it can compete with the frost weed. Uh, so once you exclude the deer from it, we found out that grasses were growing like crazy and we were getting a bunch of really high quality um, palatable, nutritionally valuable species coming up in these exposures that we were not seeing outside. Uh, so, you know, yeah, there could be some effect of whitetail on this, but again, um, whitetail do not eat a lot of grasses. Uh, so, so there, there's a, you know, quite, quite an impact here over, you know, are, are what, you know, what are axis doing versus, versus whitetail. Uh, they do, along with whitetail, prevent and slow the regeneration of large hardwoods. Um, if you have an area where you are finding young pecans or young live oak, cedar elm, um, any of the other oaks, whatever, protect it. 
um, we are seeing more of a shift to areas of old age um, pecan stands, old age live oak stands, because the regeneration or the young one, the young seedlings are getting um, consumed before they ever get high enough to, to have any kind of protection from herbivory um, or compete with what's around them. So, so protect those areas if, if you can, if you find them, um, because we, we need that regeneration of the large hardwoods. Uh, otherwise, we're going to start seeing declines in those because everything's currently much older. Uh, impacts on, on, on soil. I don't know how well you can see this um, on your screen, but this, this is a satellite imagery of uh, part of the Texas Tech campus in junction. These, the, along this side is, is piled up um, mesquite that was taken down 10 years or so, or 10 years ago or so. Uh, this is, is kind of the one opening in it, and you can see axis trails radiating out from that one open. This is from satellite imagery, and we can see axis trails. And because of that behavior, they are digging those trails deeper and deeper. Some of these trails are six inches deep, um, where they have eroded the, the topsoil off of those trails. And then once they've eroded it, eroded the topsoil, they've also contributed to um, compaction. They've, they've compacted the soil and nothing grows on these trails anymore. They've, you know, because they use these same trails day after day after day, um, they, they, can, they erode the topsoil and then they compact it and we lose the ability to get um, vegetation in those areas where they are going constantly uh, day after day after day. Additionally, um, they remove stabilizing plants. And for the most part, this is especially important in, in the riparian zones where our, our native grasses have large underground roots, root systems that are stabilizing the soil and especially around cut banks. Um, so I said, you know, as they remove those those native grasses, they remove those those root structures that that stabilize our, the soils that prevent ero further erosion into the rivers, impacting the health of the rivers. So I want to show you um, a, a little video here. I want you to pay attention to this guy right here, and specifically his nose. And I'll play it a couple times because it's kind of hard to see. But oh, it did. There it goes. So first, he's he's eating around an exclosure, and and he's poking his nose into the exclosure. That's one thing. But I'll I'll play it again. Pay attention to what he does right as he's pulling his face out of the exclosure. Okay. And I, again, I don't know how, how good you can see this, but there is a black blob that we can see him pulling out of the exclosure. And what he's doing here is he is not nipping and taking off just the, the tops of the grass. What he is doing is he is clamping and he is pulling out. He is pulling out that entire clump of grass by the roots. So, so not only are they affecting the above grass, above ground biomass just from, from eating, some of their behavior is, is impacting the root structures by literally removing the, removing the entire plant and removing the below ground um, biomass too. So, so they're having impacts above and below ground that stabilize um, sensitive riparian soils. And this is this is that same exposure that I, sh I showed you where there was bare ground um, outside, grasses inside, it's the same one on the, on the state park. Uh, so this was only located about, oh, 30, maybe 40 uh, yards from the, the cut bank on the river there. So it was not very far away 
he could have impacts of erosion into the river at this very site just by pulling out um, clumps of grass by the roots. So uh, what, what about, you know, we've gone through habitat, impacts on habitat, impacts soil, vegetation, all that. Let's get down to what, what kind of impacts they have on whitetail. How, how much do they compete? Um, if we look at kind of the classical sense of competition where they're competing over food sources, other, other sides of it, um, to some amount, they do. They do compete because axis can uh, put their diet across the entire spectrum from grasses to browse. Um, and, and in some years, take 2011, for example, uh, when browse was, was quite limited, um, there, there could have been an impact where high densities of whitetail, high densities of axis dropped that, you know, decreased the browse to being unavailable at a certain point of the year. Axis switched to what to to grasses once both species were done consuming grass, and that's when the whitetail just started dropping dead because they could were having trouble finding um, high quality what food that they can digest, can since they can't really digest um, grasses too much. We we do know that there is a fair amount of competition uh, at deer feeders and. This is kind of a, a dark image, but that's an axis buck chasing off a white-tailed doe uh, from a line of corn. Uh, so, and then, you know, that buck is, is kind of paying attention elsewhere while the axis are eating. Um, so, so there is a fair amount of, amount of competition probably at the feeders. Uh, but for the most part, when, when we're looking at impacts of, of axis on whitetail, what we're probably um, getting is, is largely physical displacement. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, and just give me a, one second here. And so, and what I mean by, by physical displacement is axis are driving out whitetail from the highest quality habitat, which would be the riparian zones. When we are saturating um, riparian zones with huge herds of axis that, you know, could be hundreds of individuals. They are taking up all of the ability of those habitats to hold a deer species. And they are pushing whitetail out of those areas into subpar habitats that don't have the nutritional um, capacity to uh, support as high of a population. You know, so the axis are in the good areas, the whitetail being pushed out to the lower quality areas. And we, we know that this is happening. We know that axis are socially dominant uh, to whitetail. They do displace, displace axis. So this is probably the largest um, true impact on, on whitetail that axis have. So all that being said, what kind of impacts do we have? Everything. What is there to control the axis population? And we can look at a couple different things, predation, disease, um, hunting, um, the, the freeze will be the last thing I go into. But, but predation wise, there's probably very little. Um, we, we know that fawns can be taken by bobcats, coyotes, and pigs. Um, this is one that I, this is a kill that I found on uh, the Junction campus. Uh, it was a young fawn, probably only a week old, that showed uh, telltale signs of, of being a bobcat kill. Um, versus you know, how the back end was eaten out, um, some marks around the, around the throat and everything that, that indicated it was a bobcat. Uh, we, there's probably some uh, coyotes and pigs that do take uh, fawns too, but one of the interesting things here is native predators, bobcats and coyotes, they have adapted, co-evolved to utilize the fawn crop of the native species when it is most abundant. So whitetail fawn crop is most abundant May and June. 
that's when um, pups and kittens are being born. And the, the adults, bobcats and coyotes, have to get the food sources for their, their young. But since the majority of axis are born earlier in the year, bobcats and coyotes don't necessarily have to utilize that resource, need that resource at that time. And because of that, there may be proportionally less predation on the fawns um, because of just that temporal mismatch. If, if we look at adults, what is there out there that legitimately could kill an, an adult axis deer? And we're talking a large body, especially once we start getting into buck, large body bucks that maybe 200, 200 to 250 pounds. What is there for a predator that legitimately could take those down? Uh, mountain lions and black bears, they are not in high enough densities uh, in the hill country where axis and it, extending out where axis are that really could have a population level impact. Um, what, what is interesting though, is we get into an area called the ecology of fear, where a prey learns that a certain species is a predator. So I have, and you know, they respond to that, they avoid areas where the predators are and everything. I have seen herds of axis that were 50 to 60 individuals um, and a, a bobcat came through uh, one time and a, a coyote another time. And the entire herd spooked. Biggest body bucks, big does, every, you know, the fawns, everybody spooked. And, and what's interesting is, honestly, any of the adults, if they tried, probably could have killed either that bobcat or that coyote. They could have got on their hind legs and killed it. Um, but they're recognizing that as a predator and they are, are, are fleeing. So they have over 90 years developed that, that instinct um, to, to avoid that. Uh, but for the most part, they're free of, of probably high levels of predation. So <laughs> the next thing is what honestly kills axis in the hill country? It's us, it's bumper and bullet either by hitting on the road or hunting. And those are the two major sources of mortality of axis deer in Texas is, is what we do. So if we're looking to control them, we've got to, it's gotta be us that's doing it. We don't have um, predators really to control them. So, so next, disease, can that control the population? Well, Unfortunately, probably no. Um, they are considered quite disease hardy. Uh, that being said, uh, they, they are confirmed carriers of, of epizootic hemorrhagic, blue tongue. Um, those are both uh, white tail diseases. Uh, malignant catarrhal fever, which is actually the only disease that I have ever confirmed as killing an axis uh, in Texas. This is a primarily a sheep and goat disease. Uh, it, what it does is it um, ends up affecting the eyes and they kind of, and they go blind. Um, and that's where we had one on the state park they found and it was, pro had cataracts, was probably blind um, and, and just couldn't eat because of that. Uh, brucellosis, bovine TB, parainfluenza type three, those are all cattle diseases. Uh, so if Axis would get those, potentially could interact with cattle and could spread it. Uh, some of you probably remember the anthrax outbreak a few years ago. Um, we did have reports that were very similar to other confirmed uh, events, confirmed anthrax cases that were Axis dying. So they probably did die of anthrax um, at, at some level. But if, if we get to the elephant in the room here, what about chronic wasting disease? Uh, there are no positive tests that have ever been recorded in Axis. But we just published a paper that indicates that based upon genetics, indicates they are susceptible. They could contract and potentially get CWD. Um, 
so I'm going to go into this more, but let me just straight out here and say, please, 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 if you harvest an axis this fall and um, have the opportunity and the ability, please take it to the check stations. Uh, I know some of the people at the Uvalde check station, they will take it. They will, uh, TPWD should take it at other places, other check stations. Please take access to the check stations for testing. We need that data to, to more accurately assess what the risk of, of access um, with CWD is, given that they um, are likely uh, susceptible based upon genetics. And I don't want to go into it too deeply here because it is, it will get into the weeds of, of genetics, but if you are interested, um, our paper that we, we published back in, in April that goes through this is called titled Characterization of the Prion Protein Gene and Access to Your and Implications for Susceptibility to Chronic Waste Disease. Uh, it's published in the journal Prion. It is publicly available for free online. You do not have to pay to access it. And if you look up Axis Deer CWD Genetics uh, on Google, it will be the first thing that comes up. Uh, so you, you can uh, access it if you're interested. Um, but, but what kind of risks do, do Axis pose now that we, we think that they are susceptible? Um, you know, they do interact with, with whitetail a fair amount, especially um, at, at supplemental feed sites. Uh, and we, we know that these are, are high transmission sites. So, you know, they, they could theoretically be contracting it and spreading it um, at these supplemental sites that, that we don't know about. And then, you know, there's that risk of relocating um, trapped axes. You know, the regular lack of regulation, you can move them anywhere. Um, so with, with this, all the, the trapping and relocations, we could theoretically be spreading the CWD without our knowledge. Um, so, so like I said, that, you know, all goes back to the, please take, take access to the test, um, to the check stations if you have the um, ability to. So, so let's get into the, the final thing. What obviously we saw um, in February that what, what can impact the population is the cold, is cold weather is the freeze. Um, axis are, like I said, are from India. They are a tropical species. They are not adapted to experiencing five, six, seven days of single digit free freezing rain, all the stuff that we had back in February. This was one of the, I'm sure many of you have seen this photo. This was one of the first photos that came out that that strongly suggested the freeze was having an impact um, on them. The precise impacts are, are really unknown. Um, we, we, we have some hypotheses, we have some ideas over, over how long the, the impact is gonna, is gonna be affecting the population. Um, but, but estimates of mortality vary. Um, the, for the most part, what I heard locally uh, on the high end was 20 to 30 percent, but I did hear some areas, um, some high fences that said they lost 80, 90 percent. Um, so, so the mortality varied greatly, and that probably had something to do with um, what food was available, what cover was available, and everything, and multiple other factors that are just, they're, they're too much and too tough to get into right now. Um, but, but really we can look at it locally, but it's, it's really unknown regionally. You know, what happened across the entire range? Um, for, for instance, on, on Tech's campus in Junction, they told me they did not find a dead axis on 300 acres. Um, so, so local, you know, locally there was, you know, this drastic range of, of what died. Um, so, you know, what, what really is the uh, impact regionally for how much, what proportion died? I don't know. Um, and 
at least tens, tens of thousands. We can at least say that. Um, but, but really what's the percentage, what's what, you know, across the region, we don't know. Um, and we probably won't ever know. Uh, what, what we do think happened, uh, though, from this mortality is, is an opening up of saturated habitat. And, and what I mean by that is those large groups that were completely taking up the carrying capacity of a particular habitat patch, those were, were probably lost a fair amount. Um, and what we probably see now is smaller groups that are more, more spread out. Um, so, so on the one hand, yes, we, we dropped access population. If we're concerned about access numbers, that's good. But on the other hand, we just opened up all this habitat that was saturated. And now we can get, we can have fawns be born to take up that new area. We can increase our population more. So, so how long for this population to recover? I don't think it'll be very long. I think in five, six years, we will see comparable levels to what we had prior to the freeze. In some areas, we may see it as soon as two to three years that we are, are dealing with comparable levels. Um, so with their reproductive success, the fact that there is opening up of, of habitat um, now, it probably won't take very long for them to recover to what they were pre-freeze. So, so but, but during the freeze, what, what happened? What, um, a lot of this is, is from observation, uh, educated hypotheses, stuff like that. Um, but we can deduce some things that, that happened. Uh, conditions were not great to begin with at that time. There was pretty poor range condition. Um, and as a result, uh, they had low um, fat reserves. This was uh, taken, these photos were taken by Ryan Schmidt, biologist out of uh, Edwards County uh, for me. These deer, these uh, does had absolutely no fat on the rump. Um, and, and when mammals are, are stressed, um, we, we, mammals put on fat reserves in the order of in the bone marrow, around the or then around the organs, then under the skin, over the rump. In, they use fat reserves in the opposite order. They use under, you know, under the skin, over the rump fat first, organ fat. If you get to bone marrow fat, they're almost dead. Um, so, you know, I, these photos were taken in Edwards County. I had other people take, taking photos in, Kimble, in Kendall County, in Kimball County, um, all over the place. A lot of the dead ones had no fat. They did not so either they didn't have the reserves to begin with that would have allowed them to survive during the freeze or they used up what they had uh, and, that, and then died afterwards. Um, the next thing that, that, prob that we hypothesized is uh, the temperature led to hypothermia. That's fairly obvious, single digit weather hypothermia. Um, but what probably happened is a, is a change in the temperature of their gut which change, in, in response to that, the bacteria in the gut uh, changed and they probably went to a more acidic um, system in their guts. So they probably ended up dying of acidosis, of, of over, overly high at, at, um, pH in their gut. This was probably compounded by the fact that most of them were searching for juniper for cover. And when they were using juniper for cover, since nothing else grows under juniper, they were also having to eat juniper, which is highly acidic, and was compounding the acidosis problem in their gut. Um, and we did have some evidence of this, of, of poorly digested um, plant material that was found in the stomach of, of dead ones that, that supports that they died of just having having um, acidic guts. Um, next, it was during that primary fawning season. It was when 70% of the fawns are born. So, you know, I said new, um, pregnancy is 
hugely energetically expensive. These does were already stressed from finishing their pregnancies. So without those, you know, added reserves to survive the cold, you know, does that hadn't given birth were dying. And then you had all the newborn fawns that, you know, they're at most a week old hitting that kind of temperature. There's no way that those newborn fawns had the ability to survive that extended length of cold. Um, we also saw, and if you've been hunting, if you look at, at hunting photos online, you probably have seen um, evidence of frostbitten antlers. Um, and this is, this is not the best photo um, of it because there's only a few small examples, but this black piece at the tip here, that's frostbite. Velvet antlers are living tissue. They, they're just like our fingers. They are susceptible to frostbite. Um, so if you've seen blunted antlers um, on, on bucks harvested this year, it's because they lost the tip from frostbite. Um, if, if anybody, and I'll, I'll share my email here in a minute, if anybody has a really good picture of this, please send it to me. I'm looking for a good example of this. Um, but we also had, we had reports of mortality actually from frostbite and antlers. Um, we had one where the guy told us, unfortunately didn't take a picture of it, but he told us that both antlers, two weeks after the freeze, he found a, a buck where both antlers were entirely black. Um, so what probably happened is the entire antler got frostbite. It got infected. Uh, it started going necrotic tissue and that deer died of blood poisoning. That has got to be a horrible way to die. Um, but it probably happened. There was probably mortality from, from frostbite and antlers. And if we actually look at this comparable to native species of, of deer throughout North America, even if we go into far northern Canada, where moose and caribou, um, they do not grow their antlers in January and February when it's cold. Um, the natives just do not do that. So, so they have adapted probably to this, you know, cold period during winter that you don't want to grow living tissue that has no other protection um, like antlers. I mean, obviously you can't tuck antlers into being cold like we can our into being warm like we can our fingers. Um, so, you know, if you, you grow antlers when there's high risk of cold weather, that's a bad idea. You put this tropical species here, and we've never really had it until this year. They, but they had frostbite on their on their antlers. Um, so, so like I said, axis deer are not adapted to this prolonged cold. Um, but what what is interesting, and it's entirely speculative at this point. We don't know it if if this is happening. But theoretically, let's say half of the population was not susceptible to cold. Half of it was. So we had 50-50. Let's look only at the 50% that was susceptible to cold. Say we lost half of that. So we lost 20, say we lost 25% of the population. Again, speculative. But what we've done is we've actually shifted the, the proportions now to being 66% uh, resistant to cold and 34% uh, susceptible. We've actually had natural selection just occur. We could have theoretically have um, deer axis that, you know, we, we could have just shifted the population to being uh, resistant to cold weather. And if we get another cold snap in the future, we could see less die off um, if this is in, indeed happening. So, you know, there was, it really, the freeze was the perfect storm. It hit at the wrong time of the year, um, the wrong year overall because of poor range condition. Um, the biology and the ecology of the species hurt them. Um, it was the perfect storm to kill off a bunch of axis. Like I said, we don't know how many 
we know it obviously had to be a fair amount um, just from reports and pictures, but you know, that it, I don't think it'll have a, a true long-term impact um, probably five to six years down the road uh, at most, we will see recovery of, of access. So if we want to, you know, be controlling them, we'll have to do other things on our, our own. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Frank, if you want to kind of moderate questions and, and give them to me, but uh, if there's any, any in the audience, um, my email is, is up, feel free to email me any questions. I will do the do my best to get back to you as soon as possible um, with, with what we know, but uh, I will take any questions if there is any. All right, y'all, let's thank Matt. He can hear you clap, so clap for him. <laughs> Being a busy PhD candidate, we really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us because I know you have a lot going on right now. Um, any questions yeah. from the room that y'all want to ask? All right, Matt, I don't think we have any questions for you, uh, but we'll definitely take down your email and I can share that if anybody else needs it. Um, that was a fascinating presentation for me that I learned. I didn't know almost any of that information. So thank you so much. Um, yep. And uh, thanks for sharing. Yep, no problem.